Hi guys, Dane here, and today I am going to be doing my December 2018 wrap-up. Hooray! I'm almost up to date! I mean, what's the, what's the date? Oh, it's the 10th of January, I should know that because it's my best friend's birthday and he just turned 30 and it scares the crap out of me because I've known him since we were 12. Anyway, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, also, fun fact, I've just realised that I wasn't filming in full HD for a long time. Basically, since ages ago, I posted a video of me and Jordana at an open mic, and to film that, I had to turn off full HD because after, like, the file size reaches two gigabytes or whatever, my, my camera just stops. You don't want to know this, you want to see what I read. So after a couple of pretty sketchy months in October and November where I didn't read as much, I got back to the uh, grind in December and had a pretty good reading month, so we'll just jump straight on in. So the first book is Villainous Victorians by Terry Deary. This is one of the Horrible Histories books. And this is for if you want to know why burglars were scared of bogeys, which poet said he ate an ape, and how a snick fadger might kidnap your spangle. Wouldn't you like to know? Well, you have to read the book, won't you? There are two Victorian books. There's also Vile Victorians, which is part of the same series. And um, I don't know, I enjoyed them both, actually. I always find the Victorians pretty fascinating. I think I said this in my last review when I reviewed Vile Victorians. Uh, this is probably the better of the two, in my opinion. I'll give it a four out of five. It does still have a lot of the problems that the Horrible Histories books have in general, which is that there are a lot of, like quizzes and things that force you to kind of keep flicking through the pages and kind of disrupt your reading habit. But overall, I thought it was pretty good. You've obviously got here a little chimney sweep saying, I'm going up in the world, which is pretty typical of the sense of humour. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Do you, do you, I tell you what, one of these facts is true, one of these facts is false. So, uh, fact number one, H.G. Wells had two pens for writing, a big pen for big words and a small pen for small words. And fact number two, Charles Dickens' house was so cold, his ink froze solid. Pause the video now. Let me know in the comments your answers. And uh, here are the official answers. So, fact number one about H.G. Wells is true. In his book, The History of Mr. Polly, his character says, Sesquipedalan verba juice. It means big words. What sort of pen did he need for that? And so that obviously means that the uh, Dickens fact was false. He was poor as a child, but did well as a writer and lived comfortably. So there you go. Alright, and that was actually the last one of the Horrible Histories box set. I did a full wrap-up of the box set, ranking the books from best to uh, worst to best, I believe I did. I'll link that below. And then I moved on to the Vintage Mini Moderns. So, this is Babies by Anne Enright. And uh, this is selected from the book Making Babies. You will be surprised by my reaction to this, because I hate kids and have no intention of ever having them. But I thought this was fascinating. And part of the reason for that is because... I've never really read anything from the point of view of a mother, but actually specifically of a mother going through pregnancy and childbirth. And, uh, you know, it, it doesn't shy away from things, let's put it that way. But for me, I thought that was fascinating. Like, I, I didn't know a lot of the stuff that she wrote about. And, uh, yeah, I gave it a four out of five and was I, I was expecting to hate this and uh, really did enjoy it. And so if you're, th this is probably one, I don't know whether I'd recommend it for general reading, but if you're pregnant or if you've been pregnant, or if you're a woman, or if you're a man, and your woman is pregnant. Is that mis that sounded a bit misogynistic, I didn't mean it like that. But anyway, yeah, if you're interested in pregnancy, and what pregnancy is actually like, as opposed to what it looks like in magazines and stuff, so uh, this, this will do you nicely. Alright, next up we have A Sense of Reality by Graham Greene. So, Graham Greene is one of my favourite authors, and he's another one of these ones who I'm trying to just read everything they've ever published. This is four stories. Uh, it's Under the Garden is the main one. We also have A Visit to Morin, Dream of a Strange Land, and A Discovery in the Woods. Under the Garden was my favourite, but it was weird. It wasn't like... If you've read Graham Greene before, you almost... You'd, you'd tell it was him from the writing style, but not from the story. Basically, these kids, like... They find somebody living under the garden, basically, and <laughs> and then uh, I don't want to give too much away about it. I really enjoyed it, actually. I mean, it is two-thirds of the book, so perhaps that's why it's my favourite story in the collection. But uh, overall, yeah, good good little collection here. I'll give it four out of five again. I, I don't want to dwell too much on it, because we've got a lot of books today. So next up, we have a five out of five, and this is Electric Dreams, the collected works of Jim Painter. So Jim Painter is an internet personality. He literally makes these things in paint. So here we have Brian Blessed punching a polar bear, and people like write in and say what they want. So, dear Jim, please paint me Ross Kemp on toast. Cheers, Toby. If you're British, you'll get that. If you're American, you probably will not. He's uh, 
Yeah, he was an EastEnders. In fact, a lot of this is very British. Oh, here we go. Dear Jim, please can you paint for me the beautiful moment when Voldemort finally finds a Coke bottle with his name on it? Cheers, Lee. And bearing in mind these are all done in Microsoft Paint. Barry Scott overdosing on Sillit Bang. That's another British reference there. <laughs> so I guess I wouldn't recommend this unless you, you're familiar with British culture. Morrissey ruins Christmas. Just hilarious, like non-stop fun from cover to cover. Beautiful. And uh, check out Jim or Painter on Facebook if you haven't already. I don't know if he's still going, but I think he is. In fact, he is because um, he's got a new book coming out through Unbound, which also published Stephen Colgan, who I've talked about before. They're publishing Ollie Jacobs' his next book. And that's a lovely little segue to Kirk Sandblaster and the Ice Pirates of Lure by Ollie Jacobs. So Ollie Jacobs is an author from here in High Wycombe. He's an indie author. These books, they're part of a series, and uh, I actually reviewed three of these for Tarden Danes, Indie Read Along, and spoiler alert, two more are coming soon because I finished the rest of the series because I enjoyed them. They're kind of almost Douglas Adams-y, sci-fi humour. Kirk Sandblaster is a, sp a space adventurer. He's got a sidekick called Zla with two heads, and in this one, they go and fight some ice pirates, basically. My first introduction to the series is not actually the first book. In fact, I think it might even be the fourth. I don't know, I can't remember now. But, um, yeah, very humorous. Let me read the blurb. Brrr! He's back, and this time he's chilly. Fresh from his adventures in the Dark Quadrant, Kirk Sandblaster is hired by the University Government to explore. Along with Zla, he finds trouble at their port of call. Lur, an ice planet filled with angry ice pirates. And ice. Lots of ice. So get your Horgorian thermals on and grab a sandwich for Kirk Sandblaster and the Ice Pirates of Lur. I will link below to my full reviews of these three books because I don't want to go into too much detail. This is about 3.5, it's pretty good. Um, not perfect, but it's an indie book. What do you expect, you know? And then we have here, Kirk Sandblaster versus Montague Santiago. So, I'll, again, I'll read you the blurb, why not? Whoosh! Kirk Sandblaster thinks he's got the Universia Man of the Year trophy for the taking. After all, he's saved the galaxy numerous times and won the game of Loria. Sure, he's wanted by the GAF, but that's a minor detail. The only thing standing in his way is a suave time traveller named Montague Santiago. In the fifth of the Sandblaster series by Ollie Jacobs, follow Kirk and his loyal Zarian comrade, Zla, as they travel through space and time. Read as they face time madness, ancient dinosaurs, and the dark secrets of Sandblaster's past. This one is probably a 3.75. It was a little bit a little bit better than uh, the Ice Pirates, but it's not the best one in the series. I will also add, you can read these out of order if you want. I did. I would probably recommend reading them in order, but you can read them out of order if you want. Alright, then we have Louis de Bernier, Captain Corelli's Mandolin. And I picked this up because my friend Amy said it was one of her favourite books. And she previously recommended uh, Nick Cave. Uh, what, what, what the fuck was that book called? And the Ass Saw the Angel. And I read that and actually really enjoyed it. It's, one, it's in my top books of the year list. This one, not so much. I did like... A lot of the world building, it was just a very slow burner of a book. It was much more about character development than plot. And considering it was set during the Second World War, it's kind of dull. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is what it is. There's a movie of it as well, but I heard the movie wasn't very good. My driving guy said that, so I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm going to watch the movie. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a three out of five. It, I've read worse. But it was also quite long, and uh, yeah, this ended up becoming one of my uh, bedside books that I read in the evening, you know. Here we have Zhaolo Guo, probably said that wrong, uh, language. And I'm going to read a little bit of this for you so you can get a feel for the writing style. This is selected from the book A Concise Chinese to English Dictionary for Lovers. And basically, it's all written in dialect, and it's all about when she first came to the UK. Here we go, I like this bit. Night long and lonely, staying nervously in tacky room. London should be like Emperor's City, but I cannot feel it. Noise coming from other room, laughing in drunkenly way. Upstairs, TV news speaking intensely nonsense. Often the man shouting like mad in the street. I worry. I worry I'm getting lost and nobody in China can find me anymore. How am I finding important places including Buckingham Palace or Big Stupid Clock? I'm looking everywhere but not seeing big posters of David Beckham, Spicy Girls or President Margaret Thatcher. In China, we hanging them everywhere. English person not respect their heroes or what? Now I think I mentioned this in a reading vlog and somebody said it sounded like it could quickly get annoying but it didn't get annoying. 
I actually really like the way that it was written like that. I thought it added to the book. And I do want to read the full book this is an excerpt from. I'm not going to give this a 5 out of 5, just in case I do read that book and then give that a 5 out of 5. This is a solid 4.5 and uh, one of the better vintage mini moderns, in my opinion. And also just great. It's great for the way it looks at language, but also the way it looks at culture and what it means to be an immigrant or a stranger in a strange land. Okay, then we have Work by Joseph Heller. So this is from the book Something Happened. I'll read you the blurb here because it'll do a better job than I can. Bob Slocum is anxious, bored and fearful of his job. So why is it he wants nothing more than the chance to speak at the next company convention? In this darkly satirical book, Joseph Heller takes us for a turn on the maddening hamster wheel of work. Heller's work places a cradle of paranoia, bravado and nauseating banter, forever shadowed by that perennial question, who's really running the show here? In Heller's hands, our daily grinders never seem so absurd. And for me, again, same as before, 4.5 out of 5 because I want to read the, the uh, book this is from. I also have Catch-22 and I haven't got round to it yet. And I'm now looking forward to it, but I'm looking forward to something happen more. And I'll probably read that as my first Heller book. This is for you if you've ever worked in an office. You're just... <laughs> It's like laugh out loud funny, but also darkly depressing at the same time. It's great. All right, next up we have a non-fiction book that I read twice in the month. And that is The Official Highway Code by the Department for Transport. So again, I'm, I'm learning to drive and I need to pass my theory test. Uh, by the way, I've been taking practice theory tests and not been doing so well. The first three that I did, I failed by one point on one question. So it's a 50 question test and you have to get 43 and I got 42 and three quizzes in a row. And now I keep getting like 30. So that doesn't bode well, but hey ho. I mean, how do you rate a book like this? It's just 3.5 out of five. I mean, it's kind of dull, but it, for what it is, it's, you know, bang on if you want to learn to drive. It's a bit weird though that there's a lot of stuff like, yeah, loads of stuff about like, I had to read all the bits about if you're driving a motorized scooter and I'm like, well, got a few years to go yet, hopefully. Okay, then we have Kirk Sandblaster Faces Tetragedon, which is the third and final Kirk Sandblaster book that I read in December. This is my favorite of the lot. I'll give this, uh, I mean, it's a four, it's a four out of five, possibly a 4.25. And in this one, basically, you know in uh, in the final Harry Potter book where they break into Azkaban? It's a bit like that, but in space. So uh, Tetras are the global currency. And what happens is Kirk Sandblaster finds that all of his Tetras have disappeared. He goes to the bank's headquarters and they're like, yeah, about that. We need you to go into this place inside the bank, which is basically like a giant data center that's also a space station. And obviously there are bad guys there and this and that happening. But it, it was really quite enjoyable. It, and again, I think the world building in this, or the universe building, was arguably better than in any of the other books, even though they spend most of their time inside this one space station. Heartly recommended. If you, um, it's probably a good one to start with, to be honest, although it does contain a fair few spoilers for the first few books. But I think with these books as well, you know what's gonna happen. You know what I mean? Like, they deliberately play into tropes. All right, here we have Cressida Cowell, How to Train Your Dragon, How to Be a Pirate. And uh, yeah, I've just been picking these up from charity shops. I'm not gonna lie, I don't remember this one too much. I believe Alvin the Treacherous comes along. And uh, yeah, he does, but he's, except he's known as Alvin the Poor But Honest Farmer. Except I've read later books in the series, so I knew who Alvin the Treacherous was. But basically, the, uh, the Hiccup's tribe, they uh, find a treasure map and they go off in search of this treasure. And they find a big chest that says, warning, do not open. And it kind of decides who's going to be the leader of the tribe in the future. You always know in these books that nothing bad is going to happen to Hiccup because he's writing them in, like, these are essentially his memoirs as an older man. So you know he's going to be fine. But, um, yeah, you know, a little pretty good sort of middle grade kids adventure. I'll, I'll give it a four out of five, yeah. All right, next up we have another vintage mini modern that apparently I'm sitting on. There we go. Fatherhood by Carl Ove Nausgaard. Now, considering I liked uh, babies, you'd think maybe I might have had a chance with this one, but no, this is basically just him talking about his kids. And for me, I get that enough from random people on Facebook. I don't want to read a book about it. It's a two out of five. It was just dull. All right, and then we have Sean Tan, The Red Tree. This is like a mixture between a graphic novel and a poem almost. He also wrote a book called The Arrival, which won some sort of literary prize. I don't know which one, because I don't care about them. But uh, that was a wordless graphic novel. This one does have words, some beautiful illustrations. Uh, I'm gonna read a little bit of it, so. Sometimes the day begins with nothing to look forward to. Darkness overcomes you. The world is a death machine. It's just beautiful, really. I can't see any reason. 
Actually, I, can't, I guess the only complaint would be that it's a bit short. I mean, it, it, it took me five minutes to read it, you know. But um, it's one that I keep picking up and going back to and flicking back through just because it's so beautiful. So I can't give it a five out of five, I guess. I'll give it a 4.5. It's pretty bloody close. It's just, just a bit on the short side, you know. Here we have Persona Non Grata, and this is edited by Isabel Kenyon. She previously sent me a book called Please Hear What I'm Not Saying. That was what the book was called. And that was in aid of Mind, which is a mental health charity. This is in aid of uh, Shelter, which is like a homeless charity. And this is basically all about people who are kind of on the fringes of society. So you have immigrants, maybe ethnic minorities, uh, you know, uh, LGBTQIA plus people. Whole range of people, really, and a whole range of poetry. Not all of it is good, but it is all, you know, I would say worth reading. I'm going to uh, try and find a relatively short poem to read to give you an idea of the writing. Here we go. Refugee, one who has been forced to leave their country in order to escape war, persecution, or natural disaster. By Carrie Danaher Hoyt. Displaced, they wander on TV screens with their worldly possessions in tow. Families in rags and suffering, losses and horrors untold. Their stories of human misery are fit into segments for news. We watch over suppers or cups of tea in the comfort of living rooms. When I kiss my kids and we say our prayers that God might grant them reprieve, I ask myself, would I go there, trade my comforts for their needs? Uncertain that I have such a measure of grace or would sacrifice like this, I pray God grants each one a place, grants me selflessness more like his. I didn't realise that was going to be a religious poem. I'm not religious, but whatever. I uh, gave this probably like a 3.75, close to a 4. It's just that some of the poems aren't as good as some of the others, but obviously it's an aid of charity as well, so definitely worth picking up, especially if you want to support indie poets. Okay, here we have some more vintage mini-moderns. So this one here is Eating by Nigella Lawson. Obviously, you've probably heard of Nigella Lawson, sort of famous chef. This is selected from How to Eat and Kitchen, two of her different books. And the reason she explains that this is called eating rather than cooking is because it is more about the philosophies of eating and how we socialise by eating. You know, we eat meals together to get to know each other, to have fun, to celebrate birthdays and Christmas and all this stuff. My only problems with this one is that it does include a lot of recipes and I think only one of them could even be veganized, most of it. I read like 10 pages on how to cook a chicken. I'm like, well, I haven't, eaten, I haven't had meat since 2004. I did like the, the passion with which she talked about it. I can't give it anything above a three out of five just because so much of it was irrelevant to me. But if you're like an omnivore and you eat everything, I, I'm sure you'd get a lot from this. And uh, I do like what she had to say about the philosophy of eating, you know? Here we have Summer by Laurie Lee. This is uh, excerpts from Cider from Cider with Rosie. And uh, I mean, it's a super high rated book and I really didn't like it. And this is another two out of five for me. I don't know what it was. It, it was just dull and I didn't like the writing style either. So those two combining together don't bode well. I must, I, even now, I cannot really remember too much of it. That's bad, isn't it? Oh, well, okay. Then we have Race by Toni Morrison. So I read this on the train back to my mum's for Christmas. And uh, it was pretty hard hit and read. There's some, it's a, it is, it's all about race and racism. And what's interesting is that like most of the characters in this have some form of racism. And it's not just like the white characters, the black characters as well. In the first story, uh, let me see what's, what it's excerpted from, from Song of Solomon. Basically, this guy is talking about how uh, he's part of this, this group where they each take a different day of the week. And every time a white person kills a black person, they kill a white person in revenge. But they don't necessarily kill the person who did the crime. They'll just kill some random, you know, teenage girl or whatever. So it's pretty dark. It's got excerpts from Song of Solomon, The Bluest Eye, and Beloved. Uh, my first brush with Toni Morrison. It was stunning, to be honest. Really well written. I'll give it a 4.5 out of 5, because it made me a little bit uncomfortable at, at quite a few points. Okay, then we have Dragons at Crumbling Castle by Terry Pratchett. I'm not going to lie, this is one that I picked up because I don't know too much about it. I've read most of Pratchett's books. He's actually my most read author. I think I've read like 60-odd. And there aren't many left that I haven't read. This is one of them. And... Uh, so then I started reading it and it turns out basically this is a bunch of short stories that were first published in the Books Free Press, which is the local newspaper here. The, uh, their office is about two miles away down that way. Pratchett actually grew up in Buckingham, uh, in, sorry, in Beaconsfield, which is like the next town along. And uh, so it was really interesting to see because a lot of the stories are set in sort of Middle England in, in the 60s basically when he was writing. And um, yeah, there's also some stuff about the carpet people which went on to become his first novel. And uh, even though he wrote all this stuff when he was a teenager, it still holds up really well. 
and this is good for kids but it's also good for parents as well there's no tie-ins with a disc world or anything like that so actually if you're new to Pratchett it's probably a good one to pick up to get to know his writing style especially if you like short stories and especially if you like middle grade and uh, yeah I'll give this one a, a solid f f f ooh. no it's a five out of five for the way it made me feel man it made me feel made me feel good okay then we have calm by Tim Parks and basically the idea here is that Parks was having some problems with his body and in quite a lot of pain and stuff and so he went along to some uh, yoga retreats to start doing meditation and to begin with he was a total skeptic and then he kind of converted and started making yoga like part of his everyday life and then he went on to another retreat and then he kind of didn't really like the guru and thought that it, there was some shady stuff going on but then he kind of changed his mind again near the end I saw on the reviews on Amazon people kind of accused him of not being genuine but I think that's kind of the point is that he just outlines his experience and experiences and lets you decide, you know? And he kind of highlights the pros and cons of, you know, meditation and mindfulness and that kind of stuff. And uh, it, it was interesting to me. I kind of related to him because I'm a bit of a skeptic as well, but I would love to get into a bit of mindfulness. I'm sure it'd be great for my mental health. Overall, it's a uh, four out of five. It's from the book Teachers to Sit Still. Probably won't read the full book because I don't feel like I need to after this. Whereas with some of the other ones of these, like with uh, Joseph Heller, for example, I, I can't wait to get to the, the full thing, you know? Whereas this, this was just the right length for me. Okay, then we have Agatha Christie, The Adventure of the Christmas Pudding. So I read this over Christmas while I was in Tamworth. The title story was probably one of the best ones. There was also, this is mostly Poirot, but there is one Marple story at the end. Even though in typical Marple style, she kind of hardly comes into it. She just offers a few insights and that kind of helps the police to figure it out. The title story, yeah, probably was the best. There was also, what is it, The Adventure of the Spanish Chest, I think it was called? The Mystery of the Spanish Chest, which I quite enjoyed, although I felt like I'd read it before, possibly because I have, or possibly because of the tropes, I don't know. My uncle pointed out that, because I'm collecting everything that was published, that includes stuff that was published in the US and stuff in the UK, and quite often stories were published in different collections in the US and the UK, so there's some overlap there, so I might have previously read it. All in all, you don't need to read this over Christmas to enjoy it. It's only really the first story that's Christmas themed. And even then, it's not overkill or anything like that. But then there are better, you know, Christie books as well. I, I would say uh, a 3.75 for me, not quite a 4. But uh, if, if you're looking for a Christmassy book next Christmas, pick this up. Okay, then we have The Employee Experience. How to Attract Talent, Retain Top Performers and Drive Results by Tracy Maylett and Matthew Ride. So this was another one. I have this client who basically pays me to read books and then to write 2,000 word spark notes summaries of them and this one I mean I managed to write my summary but it was pretty dull and quite repetitive as well to be honest I have to give it a 3 out of 5 at best like it does have some good insights but I think it's stretched out over too much book and it's not even a massive book you know and again it's one that I had to read, read in bed because it just got it got very dull I mean, I can't, I can't think of anyone on BookTube I would recommend this to, to be honest. But if you're, you know, if you, if you're working in HR or you run a team or something like that, maybe you'll get something from it. Okay, then we have Revival by Stephen King, and this one was kind of interesting because it mixes together both like a character who's a bit of a rocker, he's, you know, plays music in a band and stuff, and then like a crazy priest basically, and then a lot of stuff to do with ele electricity. You can kind of see it coming, but it, it almost turns into a retelling of Frankenstein. It's not King's best. It actually reminded me a little bit of Heart Shaped Box by Joe Hill, King's son at times, purely because of this aging rock star. He reminded me of Judas Coyne, but I think Judas Coyne was a better character. Still, I wouldn't say this is a write-off by any means. It's, uh, again, it's like a 3.75, not quite a 4, but definitely not the worst of King's newer books. Okay, then we have Jealousy by Marcel Proust. This is the first time I've read Proust, and uh, I mean, what can I say? It's it's the writing itself that really sold me on this one. I know I've mentioned earlier that I don't necessarily like it when there's no real plot to speak of. I mean, there is plot in here, but it's it's secondary to kind of the philosophies on life, and again, all this stuff, all these thoughts on jealousy. Uh, it's selected from the book In Search of Lost Time, Volume 5, if that means anything to you. Nice little introduction to Proust. I'm sure I'll read some more of him at some point. I mean, if you're if you if you're a big Bruce reader, you, you're probably not gonna not gonna really need this one, but it does make for a nice introduction. Hopefully, I've been saying his name right. Uh, yeah, four out of five, just purely for the language in this. Then we have Liberty by Virginia Woolf. Now, you may remember that uh, 
uh, that uh, uh, Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf used to be my most hated book because basically we had to read it at uni and we had to read it over the course of a week. I ended up giving up and listening to the audiobook of it, just not enjoying it. And then I reread it via audiobook for Catalyst Reads Re Readathon last year and actually really quite enjoyed it. I also enjoyed this. Now, I'm going to read the blurb actually because basically this is all about women in history, literary women in history. So, why should one half be free to live while the other is doomed to watch silently from the sidelines? In this visionary collection, Virginia Woolf leads us on a transformative journey through the liberating powers of the mind. From an exploration of why women were barred from writing and under what conditions they might break free, to the solace derived from haunting London streets, these essays and stories present Woolf at her most impassioned, rendering the pursuit of liberty one of life's most poetic adventures. Include selections from the books A Room of One's Own, The Waves, Street Haunting and other essays. And uh, yeah, really good actually. Uh, probably a four out of five. I mean, Wolf is heavy going to read, but she was right with what she was saying. And what's interesting is that a lot of the time, especially when she's looking back and talking about, say, Mary Shelley, the amount of time between us now as readers and when Wolf wrote it is about the same as the amount of time between when she was writing and looking back on Mary Shelley. So you get this kind of this view of what it was like to be a woman in the early 1800s, what it was like to be a woman in the early 1900s, and I mean, I guess what it's like to be a woman in the early 2000s. I mean, I don't know what it's like to be a woman, but, well, I guess I kind of do, because people are more open with these things these days. And then we have Home by Salman Rushdie. So this is selected from Shame, Imaginary Homelands, East West, and Joseph Anton. And I thought it was kind of funny. It's got nothing from uh, Midnight's Children or the Satanic Verses, which are his two most well-known books. But, um, yeah, it is basically all about what it's like to be like a second or third generation English Indian. Except it doesn't just limit it to Indians, it kind of covers, you know, most ethnic minorities. And I just think it's because of that it's an important book, you know? Especially for someone like me who's like white British male. I like reading stuff like this that kind of opens my eyes to a different way of living, different way of thinking. If if you're kind of, again, interested in this, this, this whole kind of immigrant way of life and what it means to call somewhere home, Good one to read. It's another four out of five. And finally we have Bosch by Henry Firth and Ian Theesby. Simple recipes, amazing food, all plants. So this is widely hailed as basically the best plant-based slash vegan cookbook. For me with cookbooks, what I've been doing is marking them as red once. Basically I, I get the cookbook, go through, note down every single recipe in there that I want to try try all of those recipes and once I've done that I can then review it because I've you know used it to, to its fullest extent. No one's going to read it from cover to cover you know. One complaint I would have is that this happened and that some of the pages fell out but then I mean do you really love a cookbook if that hasn't happened? I don't know. So again it's widely hailed as probably the best vegan cookbook. It's certainly one of the best selling ones. I actually think the, that there are a few other ones that I've that I've used that are better than this one, but it is still a decent cookbook. I'll give it a four out of five, and I think it's on sale. And they also have a new one coming out soon. So uh, come March, April, or whatever, I, I might be reviewing another cookbook from these guys. Um, if you like the food I've been making in my uh, weekly reading vlogs, chances are quite a lot of it's been from this. So yeah. All right, so my voice is going and it's getting late, so I'm going to sign off here. But as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.